The world is like a postcard. That's not my analogy. It's the analogy of the Chafetz Chaim, the great 19th century rabbi who said, when you send a postcard, what happens is at the beginning, you write in big letters, wish you were here, having a great time. And then you realize you've used up most of the card and you haven't said anything significant. So you get to that little bit at the bottom and you write in very little letters all the things that really matter. He said, that's like life. You spend years and years saying things and then as you get to the end, you realize you have to say what really matters. I'm coming to the end of the postcard. So what I want to talk to you about tonight, in kind of a reverse order, is what I believe, and then tomorrow, even more personally, the journey of how I got there. And what I want to start off with is that I believe that the world is much more than can be seen. And that if you only believe in what you can see, you are blind. And that there are wonders and there is mystery beyond the visible and beyond the material that otherwise we would not know. The poet Yeats said the world is full of magic things patiently waiting for our senses to grow sharper. You may recall that Moses, when he saw the burning bush, turned aside to look and the rabbi said, why do they say that Moses turned aside? Because the bush was always on fire since the beginning of time, but nobody saw it. But Moses looked, he paid attention. He saw beneath the material order of things to that which was greater. Think of the wonders that we know that are not material and are not physical, like mathematics, the laws of the universe that somehow are accessible to our minds. And when you begin to understand the wonder of that, the marvel and the mystery of the fact that what we see is a small fragment of what is, you understand that the real division in the world is not between the religious and the non-religious. The real division of the world is between the materialists and the non-materialists, between those who believe there's only stuff and those who know there is so much more. between those who see beyond, see more deeply, see behind the world, the tzafun, the hidden, like the afikomen, that is only revealed at the very end. That's the first thing that we believe, because after all, when we talk about God, we don't even know what we're talking about. I say sometimes to the teenagers, when you were two years old, could you imagine what a 15-year-old was like? And they say, no. I say, you can't even imagine what you can't imagine. The distance between us and God, whatever God is, is much greater than that between a two-year-old and a 15-year-old. So it's not between believers in God and non-believers in God. It's between those who appreciate the mystery and those who don't. And in this mysterious world, my second belief is that the Jewish tradition and the Jewish people have a special mission. Despite the fact that throughout history, we were persecuted, we were hated, we were pursued, we were killed, we are still here. And there are those who will foolishly say, oh, we're here because we were hated. But I remind you that lots and lots of people were hated and persecuted throughout history. But the reason you don't think of them is because they're not here anymore. 
I'm always amazed at the fact that the only reason we remember the Jebusites and the Canaanites and the Hittites is because they were enemies of Israel. Can you imagine if you went back to ancient times and said to the Canaanites, you'll be remembered for thousands of years, but only because you hate that small little people. We keep coming back over and over and over and over again. Resurrection in the Jewish tradition is not a miracle, it's a habit. This is what we do. And unfortunately, some of our people and some of our children don't have this deep sense of what it is to be proud to be in the tradition of Isaiah and Ruth, of Maimonides and Dona Gracia, remarkable people who made their way in this world against tremendous odds and understood that the Jewish story is about the story. One of the things that characterizes Jewish stories is we're not always about the ending, we're about the story. The Torah is a book that doesn't have an ending. The whole story of the Torah is about getting to the land of Israel, but when you come to the end of the five books, where are the Israelites? They're still in the desert. It's like the Philosopher Wittgenstein, from a Jewish family, said about an artichoke, he said, you can peel away the leaves to reach the artichoke only to discover that the leaves were what the artichoke was about all along. <laughs> the Jewish story is about the story. Years ago, Shlomo Karlbach used to say when he went to college campuses and he said to, and some, a student said to him, I'm a Protestant, he knew he was a Protestant. When a student said, I'm a Catholic, he knew he was a Catholic. When a student said, I'm a human being, he knew he was a Jew. <laughs> because we have not successfully instilled sometimes in ourselves the sense of this remarkable, of this astonishing, of this epical mission that we have. Four years ago, I was in Dharamsala, and I had an audience with the Dalai Lama, and the first thing he says to me is, he points at me, he goes, what's this about the chosen people? I was polite enough not to point out to him that the reason I was there was because I was supposed to talk to his monks, to the Tibetan monks, about how to survive in the diaspora, because they were all kicked out of China, and who knows better how to survive in the diaspora than the Jewish people? Instead, I said, you know, it's true. We believe we have a special mission in this world. But that doesn't mean that other people don't have missions. Everybody gets to define their own mission for themselves. And he laughed. And he said, yeah, Tibetans think we're special too. <laughs> of course you do. And they are. But by God, so are we. So are we. It used to be when someone would convert to Judaism. I don't do this practice so much anymore, but it used to be you would have to say to them first, do you wish to join this people even though we have been despised and we have been persecuted and we have been driven from land to land? Do you still wish to join? And they would have to say, af al pichen, even so, I will throw my lot with yours. But they had to know that it was not always a happy fate to be a Jew. And yet, we are still here. And part of the struggle of the Jewish people is to teach our children what it means to bear this tradition for thousands of years. I read something beautiful by Israel Leventhal, a rabbi who 100 years ago said, what is the meaning of the third commandment up there? that says you shouldn't take the Lord your God's name in vain. And he had a beautiful explanation. He said, what is the name of our people? It's Yisrael, struggles with God. He said, God's name is part of our name. And there are some people who think it doesn't matter to be part of Israel. But you can't take it in vain. We have fought so long, so hard, to get to where we are and has not been easy, but it has been noble. 
It has changed us and changed the world. And then there are other Jews, Jews who are not so universalistic that they don't care about Judaism, but Jews who are so particularistic that they don't care about the world. Like Goldfarb, who decides it's too hard and he's going to convert, so he converts. And they ask him to speak before a church group now that he is no longer Jewish. And he gets up and he says, fellow Goyim. <laughs> because he can only see the world through the lens of a Jew. But you have to understand our mission was never only about Jews. A month ago, I was in Rwanda. 28 years ago, one in 10 Rwandans were killed. About a million people, 70% of the Tutsi population, a million people in six weeks. And they weren't killed by people turning them over to the authorities, no. They were clubbed in the streets, pursued into their homes. Doctors killing patients, teachers killing students. It was almost like a mass hysteria of killing all over the country. People literally clubbing children to death in the streets. And I learned the new meaning of never again. That never again is our cry to the world. Do you know how many nations have suffered terrible tragedies and the world doesn't know about it? But the Jews decided we would not keep silent about what happened to us. And I read the most famous letter to come out of the Rwandan genocide, which was a letter written by seven pastors to the head of the church, who, by the way, ran away and did nothing, but kept the letter, which started, we wish to inform you that tomorrow we will be killed with our families. And it ended by saying, pleading for his intervention, and the last line is, the same way as the Jews were saved by Esther. And I thought, oh my God, thousands of years later, in East Africa, who do they turn to for a story of protection and salvation? They turn to the Jews. And I went to the Genocide Museum in Kilgali, and as I walked around, the first thing that struck me was it was modeled on Yad Vashem, on the Holocaust Museum in Israel. And there is a room there, the Hall of the Children. And I walked in, and it has pictures of children, and underneath it, their age, what they loved, and how they were killed. And the first child was David. He was 10 years old. He loved football and his family. And he was tortured to death. And as President Kagame said, the world stood by with its hands in its pockets. We cannot ignore the suffering of the world because we know what happened when the world ignored the suffering of the Jews. The reason that we stand with Ukraine, the reason that so many were marching on the streets for the women of Iran is because we understand what it is to suffer. It's part of being a Jew. And if you don't understand, you betray your tradition. If you care only about Jews, you betray your tradition. And if you don't care about Jews, you betray your tradition. Primo Levi, coming out of Auschwitz, said it happened and therefore it can happen again. That's the core of what we have to say. We know it can happen. We have seen it happen and not only in Germany in 1939 to 1945, but in different ways, in Cambodia, in Bosnia, in Rwanda. We've seen it happen. 
We know it can happen, and that's why we raise our voice. We cherish this world, but we are angry at the way it betrays itself. Shimon Peres once said, half kiddingly, that the great gift of the Jews to the world was dissatisfaction. But it isn't dissatisfaction. It's indignation. It's a righteous anger at the cruelties of the world that we know all too well. When Moses first leaves the palace of Pharaoh, what is the first thing he sees? He doesn't see the pyramids. He doesn't see the civilization. It says, Vayar Vesivlotam, he sees their burdens, he sees their suffering. It's the first thing he sees, and the reason he sees it is because he's a Jew. We proclaim this to the world and we proclaim it out loud because this is our legacy. We believe the world can be better than it is and we will not let it rest. This synagogue stands for Jews who do both, who love the land of Israel but also travel the world who ensure the safety of Jews but care deeply about hunger and suffering wherever it occurs, who believe in the power of our tradition but don't believe that other traditions have nothing to teach us, who recognize the resurgence of anti-Semitism and fight it with everything we can, with all of our strength, but also raise our, form, our voices against other forms of hatred that stalk our world and arise in our nation. This is a place for people who love America and love Israel and see no contradiction in those loves, but understand that those loves also embrace criticisms because love is big enough to hold truth. And finally, Finally, what I believe is not only about the universe and about our people, but about the individual. That a soul is both a gift and an achievement. That the most important statement in the Jewish tradition, in fact, the most important statement in the history of the world is that we are in the image of God. We didn't get to be an astonishing people by accident. It's because we believed that. And I hope we still believe it. In the Bible, God says, Vayihi or let there be light. But then says, Naase Adam, we will make the human being. So who's he talking to? To us. We make human beings together with God. God can't make a human being alone. We shape ourselves and shape our souls. We elevate our souls. That's why we're here. It is an old custom. It goes back to Talmudic times. It's not so frequently observed today, but I will tell you if you don't know, when a child came to learn Torah, do you know where they started? They didn't start with the story of creation. They didn't start with the story of Abraham. They started with Leviticus, which is the most boring book of the Torah. It's all about sacrifices and offerings. And they started with the portion that begins, Adam ki yakriv mikem, which is usually translated as, one among you who brings a sacrifice but literally translated is one among you who brings of yourself, mikem, from you. So children learned early on that to be a human being in this world requires some self-sacrifice, some dedication, some passion, some belief about something greater than yourself 
some resolution to spend your life on something that will outlast you, something more important than you, something greater than you, which in turn will make your life great. We owe a debt to life, to our ancestors who gave so much so that we could be here. Almost 40 years ago, when I first started doing high holiday services at Sinai, I put together a booklet. Hadn't seen it in a long time. It's old and yellowed. Some of you may remember we used to do readings out of this booklet when we were young. And I looked back through it the other day. And it had in it the beautiful words of the French Jewish writer Edmund Flegg, who wrote in part, I am a Jew because in all places where there are tears and suffering, the Jew weeps. I am a Jew because in every age when the cry of despair is heard, the Jew hopes. I am a Jew because for Israel, the world is not finished. Human beings must finish it. And I tell you, my friends, my deepest conviction is that this people, despised, dispersed, this people carries within it the seeds of eternity. That we will be here until the end of time, however that ends. Because I really believe that being a Jew is not a fate, it's a destiny. And I am so grateful that for so many years we have shared this destiny together. Gamar Chatimatova.